was and also Angela is going to Angela's gonna send a special request to you at the end of the meeting. So don't hop off, Aaron. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. So um, okay. I think I'm gonna go on mute because I think we are ready. Okay, cool. Um, so let me go ahead and get my slides set up and we can go from there. Um, your slides should be in the GitHub repository. Um, so basically, if you don't know, I will share the screen real quick. Um, so this is the GitHub repository. It has all the code, everything that you would need for today's session. It even has the code from um, the uh, session from last time, although I haven't maintained it that well. So if, if it doesn't run for the students, my bad. Um, so if you want to download this repository, all you have to do is I believe you can go to this code, this green button that says code, and then you download zip, and then you can put that file in whatever location, unzip it, and you will have access to everything. Um, the slides are right here. Um, and as you can see, I updated the TA slides about eight minutes ago. That's gonna be for the, um, that's for the practical. And then just the information session, I haven't touched that because it the information hasn't changed. AI is AI. Um, so with that being said, a quick show of hands, who was here during the last session? Um, let me not share the screen, just show, show your hands. Uh, let me know in the chat, because if you don't have the context or if you don't have everything set up, then we're gonna have to take some time to do that. So Tierra, you were here. Uh, Kaya, is your first time here? Angela, were you here last time? I can't remember. Yes, I was. Okay, so Angela was here. Um, okay, so Kaya, Quick question. Do you have Python installed on your computer? OK, and then you know how to install pip, right? Or like you know how to run pip. So if I told you to go install these packages, you could do it. Uh, PIP is the Python installer program. Um, let's just see. Let's just, when we get to that point, um, if we need to get you set up, we can. Uh, but it seems like everyone else was here. Uh, Cyril, I know you were here. Uh, okay. Okay, so Kai is 12. All right, so we will definitely get you, um, we'll help you out if need be. Um, so for the meantime, why don't I go ahead and get these slides open. I'll share my screen and we can just run through quickly to recap what we did last time or, or kind of just what the, the concept is and then what we did last time and then we'll go from there. Um, but why don't I just show you rather than tell you what we're building today uh, here, that's in the student folder, do, 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 that's students. Let me go back to the master. Let's go here. So essentially what we're working on today is a continuation from our first um, session. Um, basically, basically what ha happened is we're trying to simulate, um, we're trying to tell a robot how to solve itself being in a maze. So you can look at the scenario here where a robot, which is here, needs to get to this endpoint and it has to go through the maze and it can't hit the walls. Um, so what we did is essentially in the first session, we developed a couple of programs or a big program that had multiple scripts in it. The first script was going to be as if we were looking at this robot from a helicopter or from a plane in the sky, and we could take a picture of the maze and say, hey, this is the maze. Why don't you figure out how to solve it? Um, so we did that and we ended up getting an image for the maze. Uh, let's see if I have that in master images and let's say let's say that we were flying high in the sky we snapped an image of the maze i know it's a different maze than the one that was on the screen previously but this was our test image and this is what we were working with and now we're going to tell the robot how to solve it so when we run our program um first thing that we do is we actually do a little bit of image processing to read in the maze and so as you can see this may this image almost matches the maze that we took a picture of. Here's the picture of the maze. Here's the maze that the robot can see. Um, 
And the other thing is we had to kind of modify the maze image a bit just because of the way that the algorithm worked. We had to clear out some spots to tell it, hey, where am I starting and where am I ending? And then once we do that, we're going to set a start point for the maze, which I believe was here. So we'll set the start point here. And then we'll also set the end point here. And then after that, we're going to we're going to run our solving algorithm. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you guys how that algorithm works um, in a few minutes in case you missed it from session one or what algorithm we're using. Uh, the answer is it's an A star. Um, it's pretty good in applications like this. And if you give it a second, it's going to solve the maze. Right now it's looking for the solution. Basically the green squares are where it's looking. The red squares are where it has looked. And it is creeping along nice and slow, of course. But it's getting closer and closer because remember the blue square is our finish point. I'm only seeing a black box. Okay. Same here. I you know what? I figured I was sharing the wrong thing. Screen share, screen. There you go. Now can you see everything? Yes, thank you. All right. So to run that back one more time. Um to do so so the scenario is we have a robot that's in a maze and essentially we are flying overhead and we're taking a picture of the maze and telling the robot this is what the maze looks like go ahead and figure out how to solve it the robot says cool so we take an image of the maze like i said with our camera and then we write a program to pass that image along to the robot so this is the image that the robot has received or this is what the robot thinks the maze looks like based on the image that we gave it or we gave it. Now, we do have to modify some things because of just the way the algorithm is set up. We have to um, we have to set the start and end points and we have to clear out some blocks because it thinks that these checkers which represent the start and end points are actually walls and I couldn't come up with a good way to solve that um, in the time that I was looking at it. So we're going to clear it. We're going to clear out these sections to let the robot know that hey, you can travel here. And the next thing, whoops, accidentally cleared out that, but that's okay. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to set a start point, which is represented by this orange square. We're going to say it's here, and we're going to set an end point, which is represented by this blue square. We're going to say that goes there. And if we look back at our image that we took, the start point is roughly around that point. The end point is roughly in this area. And so afterwards, we're going to press the solve button and it is going to try to solve the maze. Oh no, it's going to take longer because it, I accidentally gave it a space that it didn't need to have, but that's okay. Um, so what's going on is essentially the green blocks are where the algorithm is looking for a path and the red boxes are where it has looked for a path. And it's going to keep on searching throughout the maze until it finally reaches that end point. And once it reaches the end point, it will back calculate a path to the start point. So let's give it some time. This algorithm is going to take a second to run just because um, it's got to look in a lot of places. And we're doing this over internet. And I'm going over Zoom and passing video and all that. So as you can see, it's getting closer and closer. It is still searching. I hope it doesn't time out, but <laughs> no. Okay, once it gets to this point, it's usually gonna it's usually gonna find its way. I don't know why it keeps on looking there. It's gonna get blocked. Now it knows it can look in this area here. Aaron, I have a question. So yes. that that maze.png um uh file or image file that you have mm -hmm. when in the a star um, python code is it automatically reading that image and then creating like your black cells based off of that image so there's actually another script uh oh oh no it timed out um i figured it would do that okay um so essentially here let me what we worked on last time from the first section is we developed a couple of scripts. Um, we developed CPU vision and then A star. And essentially CPU vision is the one that goes in, reads the image. 
it reads the maze and then it calculates where the walls is, walls of the maze are supposed to be. And then that gets passed on to a star, which then uses everything else to draw the robot path and avoiding the walls. But so the, what you're talking about, a star doesn't do that. It's handled in the CPU vision script that we wrote in the last session. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So here, let me, um, you guys have seen this maze PNG image. I'm going to close that just to save up some bandwidth. And then also I'm going to go ahead and rerun this. It, it okay. Yeah, it just it just stalled out. And it's because I gave it a bad spot. Um, so just to kind of show you what I'm talking about, let's make the start point here. Let's make the endpoint right here. Then we're gonna let it go solve. Now see it's running much faster. Come on. And that's the fun part about all this stuff is uh, watching it figure stuff out as it goes. It's pretty cool, actually. It's like a person where it's like, uh, I don't know. We're almost there. You are almost there, little, little algorithm. All right, now we're there. And as you can see, this purple line represents the path that the, the algorithm solved for. So essentially it's saying, based on the maze that I see, this purple line that I'm generating is going to be our path. And now for part two, what we're going to work on is actually implement, how would we implement this path into a system or into commands that the robot system could understand? Um, so if I have a path, now this isn't gonna be too, too exact because I found out very, very late that um, VexVR, which is the platform that I wanted to use, doesn't support text-based code. And so I couldn't make the animations based on the output from our program. So instead I had to make my own animations, which are, uh, I'm still working on them, but this would essentially be the robot solving the maze. As you can see, it's following the path. It's slightly off just because I have to tune the animation, but that's it. So now again, this would be the robot actually navigating the maze. The little green square here is our robot. And that's what we're going to work on today. Um, so what is Spider? Spider is an IDE. Essentially, it's an environment that allows us to develop Python. Um, you don't have to use Spider. You can use uh, Idle. You can use uh, VS Code, Py. PyCharm, any IDE that you want. Just essentially, it's a thing that you write Python in and it helps you track variables and all this other stuff. All right, so now moving on to part two, I'm gonna close that again just to save us a little bit of bandwidth because that is always a concern. Or before we move on to part two, rather let's just go over what we covered in part one. Um, so this was, again is an intro to AI session that is my funny comic clip about the circle of life where humanity researches AI, humanity perfects AI, AI perfects itself, AI enslaves humanity, a solar flare disables the AI, and then humanity goes back to worshiping the sun god. And I imagine that this is a cyc uh, cyclical process. So when I saw this clip, I thought it was hilarious, and I decided to add it into the uh, slides. Um, so the learning objectives, again, we wanted to cover what is AI, the components of an AI robotic system, and then specifically what we're going to do for these sessions, which are image processing, path planning, and control policy development. Um, so in session one, we focused on image processing and path planning, and now in session two, we're going to focus more on control policy development. Um, so the software that you will need, um, we'll cover this when we get to the practical. Um, all of it is going to be on the GitHub repo, which I have posted. Um, you should have everything that you need except a few external libraries. And I will tell you how to get that installed when we get to the practical. Um, oh, let me put this in presentation mode. I feel like that would help. Um, so AI and autonomous systems. Again, I'm just going to go through these slides quickly because I covered them in the first sessions. But um, this first slide talks about what is artificial intelligence and essentially um, 
It is the demonstration of intelligence by machines instead of humans and animals. Um, and this slide also mentions some of the subfields of AI, such as knowledge representation, natural learning, and object manipulation. Um, so then I just went into the origins of AI. It actually has a really cool background in science fiction. Um, I highly recommend, if you're interested in the history of robotics, um, Carol Shepik's uh, Rossum's Universal Robots is pretty much, uh, it is, Dr. Barry, wouldn't you say this is a pretty much a, a gold, like this is. It is, a, it's the gold standard. Yeah. Everyone pretty much refers to that. It's, it gives you the beginnings. Yeah. And then um, I quickly talked about just the different versions of AI, um, such as symbolic AI and a connectionist approach. Um, symbolic AI is just where you're using computers to create symbolic representations of the world and the systems that could reason about the world. Um, this style of AI dominated from about the 1950s to the 1990s. And now um, you're seeing a lot more of connectionism where you're basically saying that mental phenomenon can be described as interconnecting networks of simple and uniform units. Um, the reference for this is something called an artificial neural network, which is based off the concept of how your brain works, where you have individual neurons that work together to form this large autonomous system. That's essentially what an artificial network is. You have individual neurons or nodes that work together to help take in inputs and um, examine them and give you outputs. Um, and these, this um, style of AI is heavily based in statistics and mathematical optimization. Um, and this has really led to a large recent success in things like deep learning networks. Um, and it is really, really popular. Everybody in AI does it. It's um, if you have time and maybe, maybe a bonus session or another session we can do as an intro to neural networks, because those are so much fun. Um, so then I was just talking about three components of an autonomous robotic system. Um, you just, again, it's stuff that you see in every robotic session. It's sense, think, act. So perceive what's going on in your environment based on sensors or information from sensors. Uh, make decisions about what to do from that sensor data. In this case, our think is going to be our path planning algorithm. And then acting is executing those decisions. Um, Again, session one, we focused on sensing and thinking, and now here in session two, we're gonna focus more on the act part. Um, so this is our robot system. Like I said earlier, our robot was stuck in a maze and we need to teach it how to get itself out. Um, so quick intro into image processing. Um, first, we talked about what is computer vision, which is essentially acquiring, processing, analyzing, and understanding digital images. Now, when I say digital images, I do mean both pictures and videos because videos are just a series of pictures. Um, so computer vision techniques can apply to both. Um, and so then we're gonna, then I talked about what pictures are made of. Um, so to answer the question earlier, exactly how this is working is once we read in the pictures, we're actually looking at the values of the pixels in each picture and determining what's there. Um, so, in case you don't know what a pixel is, it's the smallest addressable element in a display device. So the smallest part of the display device that you can actually say, hey, be a color or be this is a pixel. Um, so typically when you're addressing pixels, the first pixel is going to be located on the top left corner and that's going to represent the X axis. So you again, if you imagine this is a screen, the first pixel is gonna be the top left corner and then going from, I'm sorry, I meant to say going from left to right is going to represent the x-axis and then going from up to down is going to represent the y-axis. So if this is a screen and I wanted to get to the 24th pixel, I would have to go over four and then down four. And again, this is 24. All right, sorry, over five, down five and not 24, 25. This is what I get for trying to do math on the fly. Um, but essentially this is a 25, this is a 25 pixel grid. If I wanted to get to pixel 25, it would be X4, X5, Y5. But since this is computers, things start at zero. So zero to four, four is actually five. I know that's confusing, but if you've done enough computer programming, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so another thing that we talked about is pixel manipulation. Um, looking at um, the actual RGB values in each pixel. So for a lot of pictures and in a lot of formats, um, the reason you use R 
RGB or red, green, and blue. Hold on, I have a comment. Okay. Oh, that's just for what is spider. Um, the reason why you use red, green, and blue is because they are the primary colors. And essentially, you can combine red, green, and blue. I almost said blue. Uh, you can combine red, green, and blue to make just about any color. And so in a lot of picture formats, or at least basic ones, I know they can get more fancy. But essentially, you'll have, you'll have a part of the pixel that has a red value, a green value, and a blue value. And the combined RGB will give you the actual color of that pixel. Um, so we're going to skip this. We're not going to do breakout sessions. Um, going into path planning, again, this is a computational problem to find a sequence of valid configurations that moves an object from a start point to a destination. And this is really important when we're talking about things like autonomous vehicles and robotics. So um, those, those Teslas that can drive themselves, they run all kinds of fancy path planning algorithms. Um, the robots that are on in outer space, so the one that's on Mars right now, or the multiple robots we have on Mars, all run different path planning algorithms to get to where they need to go. Um, so in order to do this, you need a map of the environment, or a, I would say a decent map of the environment, not just any map. And then you need a defined start point and a goal state. Um, and you have different algorithms to do this. Um, today, we're going to use the A star algorithm. There's also the D star algorithm. There's uh, uh, RRT. which is one time that's pretty presentation as well but we're not doing this algorithm so we can skip it um so what we're working on specifically or what we're using is the a star algorithm and this is really good for graph traversal and um, path searching essentially along grids um so it is an informed search, which means it's formulated in terms of a weighted graph, and it looks for the path to the goal node with the least cost, AKA the shortest distance. Um, so the cons of this approach are space complexities. Uh, it stores all generated nodes in memory. So if you have a massive map that you're trying to run an RRT on with a lot of nodes, it can get really slow, or you could just go, you could crash out because again, of memory issues, like you're taking too much memory. And you're also, this algorithm can be outperformed by other algorithms that can pre-process a graph before it actually does its own computation. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, this was just more in depth about how the A star algorithm works. Then we had another breakout session. And so what we did in the last session was combine the A star and the image processing. So we asked the question, how can we get this maze onto our algorithm grid? Um, we figured that out in a breakout session. And then now we're caught up to part two. So since we've got that knocked out of the way, let's go ahead and actually get into the meat and potatoes of this, this session, which is going to be taking that path that we already developed are already figured out and then translating it into robot commands. And so for this, I'm gonna pull up the TA slides and we are going to go through just the setup and um, go through the setup and uh, make sure everybody is set up. And then from there, we're gonna work on the final part of the program. Um, so everybody has Python installed. I do know that um, now. For those of you who haven't done this, you need to install the Pygame libraries and the Pillow libraries. Um, those are really easy. You just go to your Python installer, your command line, wherever you do your Python library installation, and then you type in pip install Pygame, which I will go ahead and drop in the chat, and then um, drop in the chat for everyone. Oh no, it copied the whole image. I just wanted it to copy the text, come on. Give me a second. How do I do it in Thani? I am not sure. Uh, I've never worked with Thani before. 
So pip install pygame, and then we have pip install pillow. So pygame is going to be for the graphics and the AI, um, basically for all the graphics that we're doing. And then pillow is actually going to allow us to integrate in the image processing. So um, is, if we're still waiting on people to get stuff installed, um, hi, uh, let's see, let's see if we can troubleshoot you real quick. So can you share your screen? Okay, cool, you got it? Sweet. Um, so the next thing that you guys are going to need to do once you get those libraries installed is you are going to have to go to the GitHub repository and download the new repo. Um, you could also clone the repo and then just uh, do a git pull. But I think unless you know what those words mean, yeah, down, yeah just download it as a zip. Also, guys, this is a public repository. You are more than welcome to clone it. Um, do whatever you want with it. However, I do suggest that if you're going to make changes that you want to push back to the repository, then you should do that on a separate branch. And if you don't know what any of the words mean that I just said, then this message doesn't apply to you. But um, if you're going to like, <laughs> yeah, you don't speak GitHub. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but yeah, if you if you actually plan to push things back to the repo, because I don't have it set up to where I, it, I have it set up to where everything that gets pushed will actually push in, like I won't have to approve it. Um, and I think it would just be easier if you guys made your own separate branch. So if you know what those words mean, good. If you don't know what those words mean, don't worry about it. Um, so once we get the repo installed, you are going to go to... Um, or once you get the repo downloaded, in your case, you are going to go to the students folder and then you're going to go to this session that, or to this one that says part two. And in part two, you're gonna see, you're gonna see a folder for images, a folder for output, a folder for A-star, CPU vision and robot controller. Um, so you can go ahead and open you can go ahead and open up all these scripts, but the one that we're going to focus on today is actually going to be our robot controller. And uh, if you give me two seconds, I can. AI. Okay. So I have the code share set up for our uh, for what we're going to be working.
about what we do today. Uh, ooh, I almost clicked leave. Ooh, I'm I'm doing great today. Let's do let's share the screen, and then let's talk about our let's go back to the TA slides. So again, this was focusing on the GitHub repository. We already got that. Um, the next thing is we were doing the intro to image processing. This was writing the code for it. We've already written the code, and now we're gonna. Or then we talked about how do we write the A star algorithm. Uh, we already did that, so we're good. And now um, pathfinding with computer vision. Again, that was the pathfinding algorithm. Already wrote that. And now we're going to talk about designing a robot controller. Um, so essentially, since we can solve the maze, we have to figure out a way to convert that solution into commands that the robot can understand. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to instruct you to do is to navigate to the robotcontroller.py script in the students folder. So if you go to the students folder, here, let me let me make that very explicit. So if you go to the students folder and open robotcontroller.py, then um, just let me know in the chat when you've opened that script and you should see that it's pretty empty. So once you get that script open, just let me know in the chat and we'll keep on going. Nobody? All right, guys. Did we get that? Um, did we get that script open for robotcontroller.py in the students folder? Again, let me know so that way we can move on. Okay. So if you open, I will resume back to sharing the screen. So let's share the screen. So if you open your robotcontrollers.py script, it should look something like this. It's pretty empty. We just have an import a command string, which I will explain what that is in a second, and then a get robots command, a function called get robot commands that we're actually going to build today. Um, so let's talk about what we need to do in this get robots command function. And let me shift that and make it a presentation. Um, so the two things that we need to figure out are how far does the robot need to travel and how do we tell the robot to turn exactly? Because it can get complicated, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. Um, so the first question that we're going to ask today is, how far is too far? And um, it's actually, this one is a really simple problem to solve. Uh, could anyone, off the top of your head, anyone in the audience, do you think you have a way that you could solve telling the robot what distance to travel at each step of the path? Um, so to give you guys a better idea of what I'm talking about, I'm going to run the A star algorithm again, and I'm just going to run, I'm just going to run, let's see, do, 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 do. How about I make this really, really easy for you guys to see? Uh, we're going to change one thing. We're going to. We're going to change one thing so that way we can see the grid. And then we're going to talk about how we solve the problem of telling the robot what distance to travel each time it moves to a new spot on the path. Uh, do, do, do. That's because I have it set too wide. All right. So in draw grid, I made the lines white just to make the image look pretty. But I'm going to switch them back to gray and show you Show you what um, show you what I mean. So let's switch this back to gray. Let me make sure. Nope, I am not running my code. So this is our grid. This is the this is what the robot. This is the space that the robot sees. 
And let's say that we import our maze in. So I'm going to press the F key to import our maze. So um, let's just do a quick path planning al algorithm. Let's say we start here and we end here and we get a path. Well, how exactly can we tell the robot what distance to travel? Because essentially each square represents a little bit of distance that the robot has to travel um, each square in this purple path. So my question for you guys, and feel free, please feel free to come off mute because I think that this is, this actually warrants a pretty interesting discussion. Um, how could I tell it exactly like how far to travel? Because we know that the entire map is divided into little squares. So how could I tell it what distance each little square represents? Oops. And let me put the code back up too. Anybody? Dr. Barry, any, any suggestions? Please repeat the question, Aaron. So um, essentially, as the robot is traveling, so let's say that these purple squares represent a path. Well, Please. how could I tell it how far to travel on each square? Because that's very important because essentially, we're going to have to tell the motors, hey, come on and travel this far. Well, how far is each square? So I'm assuming you're doing this with odometry or do you have encoders and feedback? Um, so no odometer, no encoders and feedback. We're just working strictly off of the VEX VR platform that they, off of the playground from the VEX VR platform. So I think when we played in there, we found that each square was 200 maybe. I'm trying to remember. But you have to know something about how what command makes the robot go across one cell. Yeah. And I thought we figured that out at some point. I, yeah. 200 is sticking in my brain for some reason. So let's um, let's take a closer <clears throat> look at the map. Does anyone else have any ideas of how we could solve this problem? You have to model the robot with the world. So you have to know the what command makes what movement happen and then scale that up for your map. Yeah. Um, so for the command, the just essentially what we're going to do is we're going to turn the robot and drive. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to run a turn command and a drive command. And the drive command is this one here, drive forward for X number of millimeters. So... Anybody else have any ideas? No participation from the chat today. Oh, I usually bribe people with like money or candy or Ask something. Kaya loves to talk. Kaya, what you got? <laughs> yeah, Kaya, come off, come on off you. Come on. Hello. Hey. What do you think, Kaya? How do you make the robot move one cell? Um, drive forward. Yes, drive forward. And the function okay. that we're going to use is this drive forward for X number of millimeters. So what we need to figure out is how many millimeters does each cell represent? Or we need I to get an estimate. What'd you say? You could run for code to find out. Yeah. We could definitely do that. Um, I am actually, I'm not going to lie. I'm a little lazy. And when I can do math and make, if I could do something faster with math and get close enough, then I'm okay. That's the engineer in me. There are some people that would like to run code to get exact answers, but I believe I believe we can do this without running some code. Um, is there anybody else in the class? Don't make me have to call names. Uh, let's see. Cyril, do you have any ideas? Okay, so I can have on the... Actually, the... 
Okay. So that one more time, you're coming in area now. Of each of the square. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So I was looking at um the areas of each of the square. So uh the fact is just that the robot doesn't really go straight. So since the path is going to be moving side rate and up, you got to do math and okay. Okay. So um I'm just looking at finding the the uh should i say the distance of each of the pixel because now it's not just the square alone okay based on this maze so there are two pictures i've seen here right so if you look at it there's actually a pixel for each when the part moves so and from all indications the pixels is not just going in one direction so there's some parts where it's going to be curved and the rest like that so these are where the whole mathematics is so we need to really know First, what path is it going to follow? We don't really know yet, so we are actually trying to get the algorithm together, give us that. Then the second thing we need to then config, uh, consider is how much how much distance it is just for one particular pixel for it to move. <laughs> so with that, then we can now discover the whole total number of pixels. Yeah, that is going to move through. So I think that's just where the whole complication is because it's not it's not like going in one straight line. So that's where the challenge is now. It's not going in one straight line. It's actually going, and when it gets an obstacle, it bends again and turns around and all that. So this is just why it's a bit complicated right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. let's, um, again, because this is an intro class and because I am a, I am like every engineer and I'm trying to do the least amount of work possible, let's, uh, let's come up with a quick and dirty solution that will be, like uh, plenty of people like to say, good enough for government work. Um, so I'm going to take this off and actually draw something on the screen. So, or, oh, can I draw in presentation mode? Can I? Does it let me do that? Uh, hold on. Does it let me draw? Uh, oh, sweet. It does let me draw. Okay. So if you think about this, this square represents, uh, there I am. All right. So this square, this is a distance, right? And essentially, we a trick that we can do is we can measure the distance or we can figure out the distance from the top of the wh white space to the bottom of the white space and then figure out what that corresponds to on our game map, so on the VEX VR map. And then from there, we can divide it by the number of squares that are inside, and that will give us a rough estimate on what how much distance does each square represent because again the cool thing about this a star algorithm is you're only you're moving along a graph and you're only moving one square and you're not doing anything crazy like moving diagonal so essentially you could model it by having the robot if the robot is going to turn then it would just turn in place and then move over a square and then turn in place and move over to the next square so that solves some of your distance issues um so let's figure out I think the best way to do this is to get the total distance of this white space in the bottom of the square or uh, basically within the maze itself and then divide that by the number of squares that we see on our map inside the maze. So to get this distance, I'm just going to do again. This is really rudimentary science, but it's basic guesstimation right now. I see that my Y location, because again, if I want to get this distance from the top to the bottom, I'm going to assume that this is the Y axis. And right now my Y location is at negative 900, which means that if I'm at negative 900 and the robot's about here, I'm willing to bet, or I'm willing to bet my bottom dollar that the total distance, like there is, it only goes to negative a thousand. Just because look at how close we are to the edge. And if we're at negative 900, I imagine, and again, you have to account for like the pixels of the robots and all that, whatever. But um, I'm willing to bet, and I think it is a safe, good guess to say that this probably goes back to negative 1,000. So if this goes back to negative 1,000, then there must be a, it must go. And again, I know I'm making a mental assumption here and a huge leap, but hopefully you guys can see my logic where if we have a negative 1,000, then there must be a positive 1,000. So this goes from positive 1,000 to negative 1,000, or it, it, it's, it's a safe guess to do so. So what's the total difference between positive 1,000 and negative 1,000? So how many millimeters would, 
how many millimeters would the top to the bottom of the square be if the top is positive 1,000 and the bottom is negative 1,000? How many would that be? So we should be getting like 500. What do you say? Okay, so either top is uh, positive 1,000, then the bottom is negative 1,000. So yep. the middle should be zero. So now we should be have if the middle is going to be zero, like the, the central part of it. So we should be having like 2,000. Yeah. So yeah, I've just seen it in the chat. Um, so we're going to assume that the total distance from the top of the square to the bottom of the square is 2,000 millimeters. And since we know that the total distance, or we're assuming that the total distance is top to bottom is 2,000 millimeters. Oh, does it let me erase too? Oh, it doesn't let me erase. OK. That's why I wanted to do it in the regular slides. But if we know that this is 2,000 millimeters, so we're, I'm just going to put 2, 0, 0, 0, and then M, M. If we count the number of squares that are represented from the top to the bottom, then we could just take 2,000 millimeters and divide that by the number of squares. And that is the distance that the robot will have to travel each square. So we're going to say number of squares. And don't you just love how good handwriting is on these uh, trackpads? OK, so if we divide 2,000 millimeters by the total number of squares, then that gives us a good idea of the distance that each square would represent. Now, I'm not going to make you guys count this. And to be honest, again, this is all we're all modeling. And this is a purely hypothetical model. It's very difficult to do this without an actual physical system. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that we're going to count that we count 45 squares. So now. Let's go to the part where we write in what the distance would represent for our uh, controller. And let me pull up my code. All right, so in your robotcontroller.py, and I will paste this to the code share if when we're done, so that way if you get lost, you can catch back up. Let's go ahead and make an equation for the square distance. And that's the distance that each square represents. So we're going to create a variable called square distance. You could also call it distance of each square. Um, I'm sure that actually makes a little bit more sense, but square distance is what popped in my head at first. Um, and so square distance in this case is going to be 2,000 divided by the number of squares, which how many squares did I say that was again? Yeah, yeah, yep. So our square distance is going to be 2,000 divided by 45. And this is a pretty OK answer. But is there anything that we can do to make this answer a little bit more robust? And if you don't, if you guys are, if you guys can't answer this question, that's OK, because it is a little, you wouldn't know it until you ran the code and saw the error. But if you can see the error, or if you could see a potential error right now, let me know. Okay, I would write this uh, if you make it 50, just make it have like a whole number or something. Though I think 45 is not going to really affect it, but then my idea was like if it's over 50, so that would be nice. Well, so let's say I go though. <laughs> well, actually, you have the right, you, you are on the right, you are on the right track. Essentially, what I wanted to do or what I was looking for is just, just to be safe because I, I'm not sure 2000 does go into four. Or 45 goes into 2000 evenly, and we don't have partial squares. So I'm just going to create, cast this as an integer. So I'm just going to make this int and put it here. And now we know that no matter what, we're getting a solid integer. We're losing a little bit of resolution if we if it is a decimal number, but that's OK. I'm willing to lose that for this example. Um, so now we've come up with our square distance. Let me go ahead and copy that into our code share. And um, if you guys want to catch up for your uh, for your um, uh, your what is this function called again? For your robotcontroller.py, you can just copy this into the robotcontroller.py, and you have everything that I have. So now that we've figured out the distance that each square represents, the next question that we have to, oh, we did that. We did that too. The next question that we have to do is figure out the turning system. 
And this is going to be a little challenging because like with many things in robotics, you have to consider a coordinate system or a robot that is rotating. And since the robot is rotating and turning, its reference frame is also turning. Here's what I mean by this statement. So let's say that we're going to define the head of the robot as this middle thing here. Well, if we tell the robot to turn right, now the head is here. If we tell it to turn right again, now the head is here. And if we tell it to turn one more time, the head is here. And so we have to consider where the robot is facing as we're trying to tell it to navigate the path that was planned for it. Because otherwise, if I'm if the robot is facing this way and I tell it to turn right, well, uh, so let's let me just show you what I'm talking about. If the robot is facing this way, you can't just say turn left, turn right without considering where the robot is, or actually, you can't just tell the robot to turn left or turn right without considering where the robot is facing. Otherwise, you're going to get very different answers. So let's just say that I have the robot facing this way. Well, if I tell it to turn right, now it's going to be facing, facing that way, right? So let's say the robot is turning right. Now it faces that way. But that's cool and all. But what happens if I say, oh, hey, well, the robot needs to go to the right. But if I tell it to turn right again, it's going to be facing, it's going to be facing do, 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 this way. Does all this make sense, guys? I know um, the the images are a little a little interesting to process, but I want to make sure that these images are making sense and that the problem that you guys understand the problem that we're dealing with. Because again, if I tell the robot turn right and it's facing if it's facing north and I tell the robot to turn right, it's now going to be facing east. But if I if it's facing east and I tell the robot to turn right again, now it's going to face south. And so because of that, like as we're navigating through the path, we have to consider where the robot was or what was its previous heading and calculate that into what its new heading would be. And there, there are a couple of ways that you can do this. Um, in reality, what you could use if you had a sensor system, if you had an IMU, um, which can track its rotation, then you could just ping the IMU for the rotation of the robot and then change your commands based off of what the IMU gives, a, gives you. But today, since we're doing all of this virtually and our virtual robot in, the, in our created environment doesn't have an IMU, we've got to do a little bit of math again and make it work. So with this math, I'm going to take what we know and make some assumptions based off of what we know to give us a good viable answer. Um, the first thing that we know is that the path, no matter what, because let's look at the path that we solved for, again, these pur this purple path here, this path only changes by one square each step. So we know that. And each of those squares is only in a cardinal direction. What that means is you can only, the path only goes north, south, east, or west. So one square up, one square down, one square to the left, or one square to the right. It doesn't do diagonals, which is a really strong key point for why, um, why this algorithm is good in maze-like situations um, or in grid-like situations specifically. It doesn't do diagonals, so it makes things a lot easier to process computationally and to follow. Um, we also know that the path of the robot only goes forward. As you can see, this was the start and this was the start and this was the finish. So the robot doesn't, the path from start to finish, no matter how you do it, is only going to be a straight path. The robot isn't going to go, um, let's just say, can I draw here? Yeah, cool. The robot isn't going to go up and then back and then up. Like if I wanted to, again, just to be thorough in this explanation, let's say that the robot started here and it, let's say the path ended here. It's only going to go to the path in a linear way. It's not going to go this way, then back this way, then up, then back, then up around, and then to the end point. 
So because of that, we can take advantage of the fact that we know we're only moving in one, we're only moving one square at a time and we're only moving in the forward direction. So that makes it really easy as we're issuing commands to this robot because we don't have to account for, well, what if the robot needs to backtrack? Because backtracking isn't a thing. Um, we can also assume in this case that the robot is going to start at the same heading. And so what I mean is that the head is always going to face the same direction, which for us is going to be pointing up or north. Um, so with, based on this assumption, we can start to then compare um, what the, if we look at what the path is asking us, we can compare its state to the previous state and the heading, and we can use that comparison to determine whether or not the robot needs to turn. And then last but not least, we're also going to assume that the path itself in the program is going to be returned as a series of squares. So it's essentially going to, when we get the path back, uh, it's going to be returned as a, so if this is our path again, um, I know the purple one is our path, but again, just to give you guys a clear example, if this is our path, then we know that we're going to get a, a value that represents this square, a value that represents this square, and all the other squares from the start of the uh, robot's path to the end of the robot's path. And based on that information, we can we can figure out a quick and dirty way to get the robot turning the right turn commands, even though we don't have things like an IMU or any other external sensors to give it uh, more information. Um, so as we go on to define a path for this robot, the first thing that we need to do is figure out a coordinate system for the rotation of the robot. And now as with any definition of a coordinate system, you can do whatever you want, just make sure you're consistent. And for the sake of this project, what I decided is that we're going to follow the same coordinate system that the unit circle uses, where positive angles are going to be represented by counterclockwise rotations. So what do I mean? Let's say that this is the robot and this is the head of the robot. If I wanted to rotate the robot positive 90 degrees, I would rotate it counterclockwise 90 degrees. So counterclockwise is just the opposite direction that the clock goes, in case you don't know. So from here to here, let's say that this is 90 degrees. And then guess what? We can do the same thing uh, going the other. We can do the same thing for the entire circle. So this is 90. Oh, can you let me erase that? Cool. Um, again, I'm just following the unit circle that we all know and love from trigonometry, uh, trigonometry class. Um, because it's just what's familiar to me. When I think about positive rotation, I just think positive rotation on the circle. So this is going to be 180. And then finally, um, just to show you guys for completeness, this will be 270. So we got an angle down and that's 270. So what does this information mean? Um, does anybody have any idea what I'm talking about? Or do you guys just want me to tell you? Or you guys want to try to chew through this? Like, do you guys know where I'm trying to go with this? Or do you want me to break it down even more? OK, break it down even more, of course. All right. so. Because we're defining a coordinate system for rotation, that means we can define turns based on that coordinate system. So let's say that, let's say that um, the robot, let's, let's change the rotation of the robot to match the starting rotation. And I'll explain exactly what I mean. So this is going to be the starting rotation of the robot. Well, again, remember, we defined our coordinate system as positive in the counterclockwise direction. So if I tell the robot to, if I tell the robot to rotate uh, positive 90 degrees, and since we're going counterclockwise, um, it's going to be, if you look at the commands, it'll be rotate left. But if I tell it to rotate left positive 90 degrees, let's look at what the state of the robot will be. So if I rotate this robot to the left, positive 90 degrees, oops, didn't mean to scale it. Now the robot is facing 
Hey, here, let me use a different color. Now the robot is facing this way. Now, what would be the equivalent of a positive 90 degree rotation in our map? Do you guys know what that would be? So let's say that we started, let's say um, again, just to draw our own path, actually I'm gonna clear this and make it a lot less confusing. Let's say that the robot starts, here. Uh, we'll, let me just throw up random points that way I can draw the black ones. Let's say the robot starts here and then the robot goes up one space and then it needs to go to the left and keep on going. So at this point where the robot is turning, guess what? If we want to tell the robot to turn left and we want to make sure that it's thorough and precise and it fits within our system, we can just say, hey, rotate 90 degrees because the robot was facing this way or facing up like our starting block. But now the robot is facing to the left, like at this point of the turn. So if we want our robot to turn left, essentially we can tell it rotate 90 degrees in the positive direction. And now you're turning left. Um, and we can do the same thing for turning right. So let's say that we want the robot to turn right. In this case, we're gonna keep rotating it. And instead of rotating at positive 90 degrees, because again, we're gonna keep with the same convention because we defined our system as rotating counterclockwise positive. Um, just to make everything consistent, this is 90. If I rotate it 180, this is 180, so it would be facing down. But then if I rotate it 90 more degrees, giving it positive 270, now the robot is facing to the right. And so essentially what we're doing is we can tell the robot, whoops, don't like that color. Let's use this one. So essentially what we're doing is we can tell the robot to turn left or turn right, not just from a arbitrary command, hey, turn left, turn right but rather we can tell it to rotate a specific number of degrees in a specific direction, and that's going to be correct every time, no matter what. So if we want our robot to rotate nine, if we want our robot to turn left, in this case, if the robot's facing forward, we just say, hey, rotate 90 degrees to the, rotate 90 degrees to the left. And if we want the robot to turn right, we just say, hey, rotate 270 degrees to the left. And that will give us the directions of left and right. Um, so with that, we can, with that, we'll always be able to, um, instead of saying arbitrarily, just fire these motors this way or fire these motors this way, we'll always be able to keep the robot in a relative system. And it will help track because as the robot's changing its headings, we're kind of ignoring, uh, we have to, we're kind of ignoring um, do, 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 the changes in the heading so that way we can keep consistency with our path. Sorry guys, that is my dog. So the next thing that we have to do, and this is where it gets a little tricky, is we have to simulate the values of an IMU or an inertial, uh, inertial measurement unit. Essentially we have to figure out, we have to figure out what, we have to figure out how the robot is rotating based on its change in position. And this is what I mean. So let's say that the robot is starting at this spot, which is, we'll define it as zero, zero. Well, the robot, as we said before, can only go in one of four directions on this grid. It can either go up one space, down one space, to the left one space, or to the right one space. Um, so. What we can do is we can actually measure the difference between the new space that the robot's at and the old space. And then we can use that difference to determine uh, not just where the robot is, but also where the robot's heading needs to, where the robot's heading was and where the robot's heading needs to be. Um, so with that sense, let's say that we moved our robot from spot zero, zero to now spot zero, one. So we're going to say that this is, da, 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 wait, 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 wait. yeah, it is zero one because this is, a, this confuses me too, just because of the way it's laid out. 
So we're on the same, we're up one, yeah. Because again, the way that the pixels are laid out, this is X, this is Y. So that's gonna be X, this is Y. So we're in the same X position, but we went up a Y position. So that's why it's zero one. I know it looks counterintuitive because we're used to the, a lot of people are used to Cartesian coordinates where it's like, sorry, X. A lot of people are used to Cartesian coordinates where when you say X, Y, um, this is X and this is, so this top line would be Y and this is X, but we're using, since we're on pixels, it's flipped. And that's a fun thing to consider as you're programming. Like it's really, really great. Um, so now we're at point zero, now we're at point zero one, right? Um, so in this case, um, we, we can look at the difference between the point that we're at versus our previous point. So our previous point, so we're gonna say previous is going to be zero, zero. And then our new point, we're gonna say new, that's going to be equal to zero, one. And so if we take the difference between our previous point and our new point, we can have a good guess of what our direction is gonna be because again, the points of the path, if we go back to the path that we're generating are only being incremented by one square at a time. So this math will hold no matter what. And again, I know that this is heavily mathematical. Um, that is essentially the nature of artificial intelligence is you're doing, not only are the AI algorithms themselves reliant on heavy math, but then also the systems modeling, which is essentially what we're doing here is we're trying to model the environment to predict what it would be next. Um, so in this case, again, we have our previous point and our new point. So if we take the difference between our new point and our previous point, then we can, we can make some assumptions. So let's say our difference. So if we take our previous point, which I'm going to represent with the P minus our new point, which is, which I'm going to represent with the new, then, so our, our, sorry, not previous minus new, it's going to be new minus previous. I mean, you could technically, technically do it the other way, but convention is to do uh, new minus old. So now we're going to have a difference and I'm going to represent this with a Delta for those of you who are mathematically inclined. Um, delta just represents a change in a value. Um, so in this case, the difference between the new point at the X position is going to be zero, but then the difference between the new point at the Y position is going to be one. Um, so, so let's talk about this difference and let's talk about what this is going to tell us for our rotation. And then we can actually code this out into a working system. Um, so since we're starting, Again, we know the heading of the robot when we start. We're going to be facing, um, we're going to be starting at the origin or zero, zero or start point or whatever. And we know that we're going to be facing north. So if the robot in its first step moves up, then this would be the difference between the new point versus the old point. And we can also define a rotation based on where based on the initial heading of the robot, and then that rotation definition will hold as we keep applying it, no matter how much it changes. So this difference is going to be zero, one. Um, this difference for this square is going to be zero. Uh, negative one. This difference is going to be one, zero, and then the, what's going to happen with the rotation? So worry about this negative one or this bottom point. This is zero, negative one, because the robot isn't going to go backwards to solve its maze on its step. Like again, um, unless the step of backwards, that's the space here and the convention of the maze that was generated. 
that rate still hold. So again, take a step. It's not going to be mathematically viable. So with that, we can decide to take. And earning facing this direction. Direction new square. Um, we can subtract. Um, um, we can basically subtract the differences between the robot's starting position and end position, and we can. which in this case means the robot is not going to rotate because again, the robot was facing this direction. The robot was facing this direction. It went up in the direction that it was facing. So there's no difference in its change of direction or in its change of, in its change of position. Well, not necessarily a change of position, but it, there's no difference in its change of heading, but Let's let's compare it to whether or not, let's say instead that, let's not say that the robot moved up in its first spot. Let's say the robot, the robot moved to the right. So the robot, which again, we're assuming is not omnidirectional. So it's going to have to turn in, in order to actually get to the square, it would physically have to turn and then move itself to the square based on the way that we have our controller modeled. Um, and so in that sense, let's say the robot did that. It turned and then it moved to the right. So now let's look at its delta of position and compare it to the previous delta. So our new delta is going to be equal to um, our new delta is going to be equal to our uh, this position minus this position. So it's going to be one minus zero. So our new delta, if I write it over here. Our new delta is going to be, let's see, we changed in the x one direction. So let me get rid of that dash so that way it doesn't look negative. So we changed in the x one direction. That's going to be one. And then we didn't change at all in the y direction. So that's going to be zero. So now if we take our new delta minus our previous delta, we're going to have one zero minus zero one. So that's going to give us a value of negative one. And then this would be one as well. So we know based on that starting position that if our new delta in position or our new delta is um, negative one one, then the robot had to turn, the robot has to be over a square to the right, which means it had to have turned to the right. And then to make sure that the system stays complete, once we generate this new, once we take this difference, we can then update our previous delta. And so now our previous delta is negative one, one. And then that would essentially be the equivalent of um, when you update the previous delta, essentially mathematically what you're doing is you are taking this whole system. Is it going to let me do it? 
Oh, I didn't keep it. No, but you're basically taking this whole system and just imagine you're like twisting the screen. You're rotating the screen um, to the, you're rotating the screen so that way the head of the robot is facing up. And so, up, oh, discard. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to close it. But essentially, you're, the reason why we're doing all this complicated math, where we're not only looking at the change in position, but also the change of the, it's not just the change in the squares, but it's the, the you're tracking the deltas, like how the squares are changing, is so that way you can create this system that's rotating with the robot. And so when it moves, it now redefines where it now it now redefines where its heading is. And so that way, when you tell it to turn left or turn right, it can go relative to that new heading. Um, I know that that was a lot to explain. So let's just go ahead and get this. Let's just go ahead and get this code written and I will let you guys go. I, again, I'm so sorry for this lecture. I know it's heavily theoretical. Um, I did try to my best to make this as digestible as possible. So. The first thing that we need to do is, again, determine, write some constants so that way we know, or write some values so that way we know like, hey, if this is our, if this is our, uh, if this is our delta value, then we're gonna turn, if this is our delta value, then we're gonna turn to the left, we're gonna turn right, et cetera. So we're gonna make some constants. Um, so right under the square distance, which we had already defined, let's create a variable called no turn and let's mark that, let's make that zero, zero. Then let's also create a variable called turn 90. And in this case, we're gonna make it negative uh, one, one. And if you continue with convention and do the math, uh, turn 270, which is basically our turn right function, that's gonna be equal to one, one. So from there, let's go ahead and um, we let's also make a variable for our initial state or like our initial previous state. So we're gonna call this the previous state variable. And this is just, again, this will correspond to like what our heading expects. So if the first, if the difference between the first square and the second square is this previous state, then the robot did not turn at all. And so this is kind of like a, this is kind of like a compass for our robot. So that way it knows what north is, what south is, and all that. Give me just a second, please. All right. So our previous state in this case, B R E V I O U S state is going to be equal to zero, negative one. And then also we have a, we have a, um, we have a variable here for our command string. I'm gonna show you what that does in a few minutes. All right, so now let's move on to the function that we're going to build in our function that we're gonna build in this code. Um, so the first thing that we're gonna do is we need to access that previous state and since it's a global variable and we're trying to access it and essentially write to it from a local function, we have to establish that it's a global variable. Now, if you were just trying to read the global variable, you wouldn't have to do this. But since we're reading and writing to a global variable, we have to um, do, we have to explicitly state, hey, this is global. Um, so we're going to say global and we're going to try to access the previous state. Up, oh, previous state. Not that. And then we're also going to try to access the command string because we're going to write our commands based on the way these rotations happen. And now um, I'm writing the command string can be anything that you anything that you want it to be based on the system that you're trying to control. Um, in this case, since we're trying to write a VEX VR system, I'm essentially going to remake whatever whatever these blocks translate to code wise. So. Um, essentially, like if you had a when started, so this function is called when started. So the code viewer in this case is defining it as when started. 
again, I'm just following this convention. You would have to adjust this to match whatever um, system you were working on. And this is the system that I'm choosing to work on. So um, for that, let's go ahead and start our command string. So we're going to write our command string and we're going to add the line for when started. Uh, to, in order to add a line to a string, you can just literally do plus equals in case you didn't know. And then it's going to say, uh, do, 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 define. It's basically going to say this line here. So I'm going to copy that line and then paste it into our string. And then at the end of at the end of these lines, because again, this is going to be essentially I'm trying to make this code here. And if you notice, this goes to a new line. So I'm just going to give it a backslash in, so that way we go to a new line. Um, so let's go ahead. Let me save my code, and then let's let me push that to the code share, so that way you guys can see it and get caught up in case you were confused. So. This is our new code share. This is what we have so far. Um, we're not really running anything, but just in case you all want to catch up. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to do is go, go back. And now uh, we're actually going to start writing. Um, we're going to write. We're going to start writing our commands at this. Squares that are getting passed into that represent actually going to call this. Um, yet. So we're going to call that the thing generates for. For us, so that that's why that's why we have path passed in as a variable in this function definition. So what we need to do is we actually um, we need to we need to look look at the, the previous square from the next compare the delta between the two squares between what our rotation deltas should be, and then add let. With that being said, let's go ahead and get this function that um, goes through our path and actually calculates everything that we want. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a for loop, and we're going to actually we have to we need the index of the for loop. So we're going to do this trick here, which is index. That's going to represent the index of the for loop, and then it points in, and we're going to enumerate our path variable that we passed in. So essentially, it's going to, to enumerate, like count the number of things in the path variable, and it's going to loop through it. And then because we did it this way, we can actually track the index of the loop and um, change our code based on the index. So with this, with the structure of this code, essentially um, here, let me explain this. So let's say that we have a path variable, right? And this path variable is going to be an array, and it's going to have coordinates for each square. So it's going to be like 0, 0, uh, 0, 1, and then 1, 1. So essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to loop through this array. And we'll let me write this as our path so that way you guys have the context. We're going to loop through this array, and we're going to look at the next value, and we're going to subtract the previous value from the next value, which is fine and dandy until you get to the end of the array. Because if you get, if you're not careful when you write your code, when you get to this last point, you're going to try to look for the next value, and the next value is going to be outside of the array, and then you would get a error because you can't index outside an array. So because of that, we have to track where the index is and basically say, hey, as long as we're not at this last space, run, run the code. 
And so that's why we're choosing to do, that's why I'm choosing to do this enumerate function so that way I can track the index and say, okay, as long as we're not at the last space, we're good. So in order to represent that in Python code, what I would say is if index um, is less than the length of the path that we passed in and then minus one because this is Python and Python index is at zero instead of one, um, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the delta x, which in this case, delta x is gonna be a represent representative of our position. Uh, so delta x, and then we're going to use this numpy function dot subtract. Basically we're gonna subtract because again, our array, our data is coming in as these points. And these are technically called tuple data types in Python. But since our data is coming in as a tuple and we want to, we want to subtract these two tuples, we have to use NumPy to do that. I mean, there are other ways to do this, but NumPy is the most efficient. So then we're going to say path at our index plus one and then path at our index. So now we've calculated that first delta. And then from there, what's going to happen is we're gonna get our IMU data to tell us which direction we should turn. And in order to do that, we're gonna make a new variable called IMU data, because again, that's what we're trying to simulate with all this. So IMU data equals and again, uh, IMU data, we're going to be subtracting tuples. So we're going to use NumPy again. So we're going to do NumPy.subtract. And then we're going to go ahead and say our new delta, like the one we adjust, our new delta position. And I, can I rename this variable? Yeah, yeah, let me rename this variable for you. So we're going to subtract our new delta position. And then we're gonna subtract that from like our previous state or like our, our intro state, which will then become our new previous state. So then, which is why I'm gonna leave the name previous state. And now since we have this IMU data, we can read it. And based off of whether this difference is zero, zero, negative one, one, or one, one, we can tell it which way to turn. And so to loop through that, we're just gonna use a simple if else if loop and we've already defined these variables as no turn. So like we already have these variables defined by name, so it's much easier to reference them. So in this case, we're gonna say if the IMU data equals no turn. So if the difference between